Welcome. Welcome to Grace Bible Fellowship, a church here in North Middletown, New Jersey. We're here to uh, make the Word of God clear and applicable to people's lives, but also worship Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. If you guys would pray with me. Father, this time we pray that you would bless with the sense of your presence as we look into your holy word, that which will endure forever. I pray that you help us, Lord, to hear from you, that you would speak to each one of us, that you might make us more like you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we're back from the resurrection. We're still under quarantine, but we're moving on in the book of 1 John. We're in chapter 2. We're going to hit about the middle section of it as we look into it. I just wanted to remind us of what the Bible says. It says in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 that all scripture is given by inspiration of God. It is profitable for doctrine, reproof, for correction, and instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. That is the promise that the scripture gives of itself that everything that we're going to look at tonight is God breathed. He literally breathed it out through his uh, apostles early on. So as we look at it, remember, it's not the word of God. This is actually the word of God, uh, not the word of man. So previously at Grace, I just wanted to remind you of where we've been because it's been a while. In, in the book of First John, John explains how it is that you can recognize that we have fellowship with Christ, that you have fellowship with Christ or someone else has fellowship with Christ, there are some earmarks, there are some defining factors that you'll see. Number one is that if we have fellowship with him if we walk in the light, practice the truth, and have fellowship, and our sins are continually washed from us. That's what the scripture promises if we do those things that the Lord would have us do. Number two, we possess the truth by confessing our sin and receive absolution, forgiveness, and perpetual cleansing. We always are in the sense of, uh, in our hearts, confessing our humility before God, and that we're sinners, that we're broken from the day that we were born to the day that we're going to die, that we're sinners, and we can't play it off as though we're something other than that. That is an earmark of somebody who knows the Lord and has a relationship with him. The opposite would tell you otherwise. So number, uh, number three, from verse 10, it says, we confess to being born in sin and marred by sin. So we confess that sin has always existed in our lives. It's not that we have been freed of it. We don't have it anymore. It's we don't have it anymore, and we were born in sin. We were broken. We're not good people. Nobody is. The fourth thing in verse 1 and 2, chapter 2, that we have an advocate and a propitiation for our failures. It's a provision, if you will, or a substitute. Who's Jesus Christ? That is what you will confess if you know the Lord Jesus Christ, is that your sins are not for you to pay for. You can't be good enough. You can't do a bunch of good deeds. You're never worthy of God's love. So God gives it freely in the life of his son. And as we accept that, he forgives us of our sins and gives us absolution. Number five, in verse three to five, we do those things which he tells us to do. One of the earmarks of a Christian is that they're obedient to what the scripture teaches, to at least what's been revealed to them. So for somebody to say that they know him and yet they walk around in darkness because they don't do what he says, they're a liar, the scripture teaches. So one of the earmarks of a Christian is that they are obedient to the things that God says. And the last, we live by the law of love as Jesus has shown us. He says, if, if you can't love your brother whom you do see, how can you love God whom you don't see? One of the earmarks, in fact, I would say probably the essential earmark of a Christian is that they have love. They have love for God and they have love for others. And you'll see it in everything that they do and how they say it. Uh, They're not out for vengeance. They're not looking to ridicule. They're not looking to hurt. They truly have love in their heart for God and they have a love for others. So those are some of the earmarks that 1 John teaches us as we go through. Moving on from verse 12. It says, I write you, little children, because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. I write to you, fathers, because you have known him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you have overcome the wicked one. I write to you, little children, because you have known the Father. I have written to you, fathers, because you have known him who is from the beginning. 
I have written to you young men because you are strong and the word of God abides in you and you have overcome the wicked one. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away, and the lust of it. But he who does the will of God abides forever. So I don't think we're going to be able to get through that entire chunk, but what we'll do is we'll get up to, I think, verse 14. So let's, uh, let's see if we can do that. If the clicker will allow me. He begins by saying, I write to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. It's, uh, it's an interesting thing. He says, you little children. The word is technion. Technion is a different word than he uses halfway through this passage where he talks about little children. Although they're interpreted the same way, there's a variance, and we'll talk about it. A technion, technion is a little child. You know, the adorable, cute face, can't do any wrong in your eyes, uh, you know, is curious about everything, is new to this world, doesn't understand 110 volts, doesn't understand gravity, doesn't understand a lot of things. And so because of that, they do a lot of crazy things, and they're usually very outspoken. They're very loud. Everything they do is dramatic and loud. Um, that's what children do. And so he's saying, I write to you little children, and he's talking about them spiritually, okay? Not little children who don't understand a language. He's obviously speaking metaphorically. So he's talking about those who are new in Christ, those who have come to know Jesus, those that are uh, the new believers. And every time I'm here on a Sunday and I speak to a crowd, I'm aware that there are several groups of people. There are believers, there are non-believers, and then there's make-believers. And in the mix of all of that, you have little children, these technions, who are brand new Christians who don't understand maybe what the word says very plainly to other people who are more mature. And then you have those who have been around for a while and have exercised their spiritual muscles. And then you have the fathers, you have those who are older, those who have wisdom. So anytime you're speaking to somebody, you have to kind of make a quick determination as to where they are. If you really want to connect and communicate with them, you have to know where they are. So he says, first of all, I'm writing to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven you. I don't know if you remember the early days of what it's like to be a Christian, but if you have come out of the world like I did, came out of a drug-addicted, angry, twisted uh, botched family, uh, if you came out of that sort of a thing, then you know what it was when you accepted Jesus into your life. Everything was new. The sky was bluer and the birds were sweeter and, and life was just good. And I don't know about you, but I told everybody about Jesus Christ in not so tactful terms, in not very gracious fashion and not very well informed either. I just knew that I was free, I was changed, and everybody had to know about this because my goodness, how come I didn't know about it until I was older? And I just was so excited and I was just exactly like what this passage is talking about. I was a little child and I was just excited about everything. And I would just show, I would give away my last dollar. I would give, I didn't care. I didn't care about anything in this world. I didn't care about my life. Didn't care what happened. I just knew that I loved Jesus and I thanked him for forgiving him my sins. And it was a physical reality. It was something that wasn't just a cognizant understanding. It was an actual experiential thing that occurred. And I couldn't help but to tell the whole world. So I wonder, do you remember that day? Do you remember that time early when you knew about Jesus and you realized that your whole life had changed? You were free to make choices. Sin didn't rule in your life anymore. I remember it, and I was just excited. I didn't start out that way, though, because the Scripture is very clear. In Romans 3.23, it says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So every single one of us is broken and twisted, and we fall short of that in which God is and which he expects us to be being made in his image. And yet, we don't have the ability to do that. And so as much as anyone might try to be good enough, no one's ever good enough. There was only one person good enough, and they died early. So it's true, the, the good die young. In Romans 6.23, For the wages of sin, which everyone is guilty of, is death. 
But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord, which means I came to understand in my childhood of spirituality that I was broken, twisted, and there was no way I could fix it. But I could receive a free gift. It wasn't about earning it, being good enough, smart enough, but I had to receive it as a free gift, what Jesus provided and how he came into a human body, lived a perfect life, and died for me. When I understood that and I confessed Jesus Christ, that's when I got saved, when my whole life changed. And it says here in Romans 10, verses 9 to 10, that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus, that the Lord Jesus, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And for with the heart one believes in the righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation which is what I did that day. I remember praying and asking Jesus into my life, and I came to believe that Jesus was who he said he was, who he demonstrated himself to be, and I came to know Jesus Christ as my Savior and Lord for my sins. Because of that, everything changed. But I didn't start out as a happy kid. I started out as a struggling kid because I wasn't sure exactly what had happened in my life. But I was a child of God, and the Scripture called me that, although I didn't fully understand what that meant. It says in Colossians chapter 2, verses 13 and 14, And you being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, having wiped away the handwriting of requirements that was against us. That's the law, by the way, which was contrary to us. He has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. Those of you who are perfectionists understand what it is to have a law in your mind of exactly the way it should be. And then you have a reality check. This is where I'm at and this is where I should be. Everyone has regrets. Nobody claims to be perfect unless you're completely delusional. But I had to admit and confess in Jesus Christ for me to become one of his children. We're all his creation, but we're not all his children, uh, contrary to popular belief. But the scripture tells me that I have been forgiven of all of my trespasses, not because I was good enough or because he picked me because I was smart enough or tall enough or skinny enough. None of those are true. But because Jesus loved me, he came and took out of the way and nailed my sin to the cross on his body. And so I'm free of it. Jesus took it away and I can live freely now. And so I am like a little kid and I'm happy about a lot of things. And Sometimes those happy things come out of my face and I say things that I probably shouldn't because I grew up on Bugs Bunny. Uh, that's what I blame. I blame it on Bugs. Romans chapter ten thirteen says, For whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It's actually a quote from Joel that's being quoted here in Romans by Paul. So, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And if you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, you can become a baby today, a brand new spiritual baby where you have a conversation with God daily and where your life changes from the inside out. And that's where we all begin. And that's why John says, I am writing to you little children, you technions, because your sins are forgiven and for his name's sake. So it's interesting. It says that we are little children and our sins are forgiven, not because we've earned it, but for his name's sake. He does that in our lives so that we might be an exhibition for him that we might be his workmanship on parade and on display for the rest of the world to see Jesus Christ in us. What a tremendous privilege that is. We get to contain the Spirit of God and and, and the Lord Jesus Christ gets glorified in our behavior by our change. And that's why he did it. That's why he forgave us of our sins, is so that he might live in us, have a relationship with us, and then be a trophy to the world. So if we're not doing that, then... We need to get on it because that's what we're called to do. And what an exciting life that is. It says in Psalm 23 about for his name's sake, it says, he restores my soul and he leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. I don't know about you, but when I was a young Christian, it seemed like it was so easy. My life was easy. It was like a spiritual honeymoon, uh, they speak of it, where I was just in love with God And I didn't know much, but I just knew that God forgave me, and I was just happy. It wasn't complex. I didn't have a whole systematic theology worked out. I had a relationship with the God of heaven, and that's all I needed. And that's I I I couldn't care about anything. If I was cold, if I was hot, if I was none of it mattered. It was so simple, and it seemed like it was protected from temptation. And as I grew in Christ, it seemed like it got much harder, and I was expected to actually do something 
pick up my feet and walk. I was supposed to make decisions and based upon the things that I was reading, I was supposed to actually get, get off my, my backside and get moving. I, I, it was all new to me and I wondered why it was so hard, but I understand God was developing his character in me for his name's sake. Because if he just saved us as babies and we were kept as babies, you know, what, what worth is that? I mean, everybody loves a baby, but no one wants to change a 43-year-old's diaper, you know. So we all need to be growing up. It's a process. It's something that God enables us to do. And it, he does it for his name's sake. So when I think of all the things I've been protected from and all the things I've been kept away from, I'm grateful that God did it for himself because I reap the benefits even as you do. So being a child of God means that we cry out to God for our needs and we are filled with joy at his presence. If you've ever had a child, you know what it's like when you come home and you walk in the door. The kid sees you and might see you out the window if they begin to anticipate you and they just light up. And of course, my poor wife has been home all day and she's at her wit's end, but I come home and I'm like, I'm like gold. I, my kids just thought I was the greatest and always ran to me and jumped on me and told me about their day and my wife was relieved I was finally home. But I enjoyed that aspect of coming home and they just lit up just because I came home. And I think that's what it is to be a child of God. It's to enjoy his presence. It's to run to him like your heavenly father. Uh, not like an earthly father, but so much more than that. The one who knows everything about us and knows every evil thing we've ever done and loves us anyway. And he forgave us by sending his only son. So when I think about that, it's just, it's a very overwhelming thing that I am called a children of God. What a wonderful thing. And you're called a child of God as well. So enjoy it. Enjoy his presence. And if you have a need, you could be like a child and just tell him. In fact, he told us to, to tell him what he needs. But the disciples came to Jesus and said, teach us how to pray. He said, you should pray in this way, as a template, if you will. Our Father, the very first beginning, hallowed be your name. And we're supposed to ask him for our stuff, ask him for daily bread, ask him for protection from sin, and walk with us through the, you know, the difficult times in our lives. So that is what it is to be a child of God, and I hope that you are one. And I hope you're enjoying it in his presence. In verse 13, he says, I write to you fathers because you have known him who was from the beginning. So he says, I've written to you children because your sins are forgiven. Now I'm writing to you fathers. Those of you who have been around, you've been up the street a little bit, not founding fathers, like, like you might understand, uh, not like you know, priests who they call father, um, not even like you know, fathers on the earth. He, he says, you fathers, you spiritual fathers, you who are a little further along in Christ, you've, you, you understand the word of God, you've been walking with Jesus for a while, you know a few things, it includes mothers, by the way. Anybody who's mature that has a walking, living, breathing relationship with God. And so as that sort of parenting, as that fatherhood begins to sink in, he's now speaking to us, God through the Apostle John, because you have known who was from the beginning. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to teach you a new word here in a minute, I think. It's gnosko. And you can all repeat after me, gnosko. Which is that word knowledge, which you see up here. You have known him who is from the beginning. To know God from the beginning, this word know is the same Old Testament word that you will find for Adam knowing his wife Eve. And I'll give you the G version. It's the most intimate level that a man and wife can share. It says that he knew his wife. And so if you want to know how that word gnosko is being used in a Hebrew Old Testament fashion, that would be an example. So you have known him. This is an intimate knowledge. It isn't just a knowledge in your mind. This is an intimate relational knowledge that, that happens by time and intimacy. It's not something that just occurs because you went to Bible college. It's not something that happens uh, b because you happen to be in proximity. It has to be a, it has to be a relationship. And this gnosko is an experiential thing. So he says, I'm speaking to you, fathers, I'm writing to you because you've known him who is from the beginning. In John 8, verses 28 to 29, Jesus gives us an interesting uh, comment. And he says this all throughout the, the, the Gospels, but he also says this, especially in the book of John. Uh, we're given, we pick it up in verse 28. And Jesus said to them, when you lift the Son of Man up, then you will know that I am he and that I do nothing of myself, but as my Father taught me. 
I speak these things. And he who sent me is with me. The Father has not left me alone, for I always do those things that please him. Jesus is teaching us a principle. He always submits to the Father. He always does, says those things which the Father tells him to. I don't know about you, but I fall short of that often. So for Jesus to say this, he's giving us an example that fathers are those to be looked up to. We understand in the Ten Commandments, uh, you're supposed to honor your father and your mother. It's something that's reinforced in the scripture because we're supposed to see God in that, that we honor God in all of these things. And your father and your mother on the earth are an expression of God's authority here on the earth as well as the government. So those are things that we're supposed to be sensitive to, that those are reflections of who God is. So Jesus submitted himself to his father. Fathers are those who have been there, done that. You know, they could write the book. They could tell you about it. And they usually tend to always be explaining that to you. And then when you get fathers that are really older and they're gray and they're grandfathers, uh, they, you know, they tend to be grumpy. I don't know if you ever saw that. Uh, they tend to be telling you what to do, not to do. Don't do that. Stop it. And their face kind of gets sucked down to the ground. And, you know, that's not what it's talking about. It's talking about somebody that possesses wisdom with love, not just a lot of information and a lot of experiences. They can't wait to sit you down and take seven hours of your time telling them, telling you about one thing. So it's not that. So that might be your experience, but that's not what Jesus is talking about. He's talking about following the Father. And what that speaks of is authority. It speaks of intimacy. In verse 13b, 13, verse 13 he says, I write to you, young men, because you have overcome the wicked one. So he says, now, those of you who are young men, of course, you're not a baby and you're not a child. You're young men. You're, uh, you know, you're getting up there into manhood. You know, if you're 10 years old, you're not a man. I'm sorry, not a man. Um, but we... We look at the young men, and young men are always known for their strength, their vitality. You know, they're in the peak of their life. We, we look up to f- people like this. We th- I think of people like Gladiator. It's one of my favorite movies. Somebody who's in the peak of his performance. He's, he's in his youth. He has abilities. He knows what he's doing. Uh, he might not know everything. Or somebody that's a quarterback or plays football. Or uh, somebody like Rocky who goes to battle. Uh, you're looking at somebody who's in, in peak performance and is trained and is ready to go out there and take on the world. That's what the scripture is saying. I'm talking to you young men because you have overcome the wicked one. And we as men especially gravitate towards sports and we look up to people like uh, soldiers and uh, people who you know, put themselves in harm's way, people on the front line, uh, people that do things that are exemplary. And of course, if you're going to have somebody like that on your side, you want somebody that's young. Uh, you know, it, it'd be good to have Rocky on your side if you were going into a fight, right? Or you could, you know, get his body double, which, you know, isn't, isn't the same thing. But he's saying, I'm writing to you f- young men because you have overcome the wicked one. So young men, if you're in that young man category, you're not a baby, you're not a child, you're you're kind of in the middle of your youth and you still possess strength. The scripture has all sorts of things that tells you in that state. Number one, it says in 1 Peter 5, 8, be sober and vigilant because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. So we're told to be vigilant, on guard, not lethargic, not sleepy, not couch potatoes. So in Ephesians 6, 16 and 17, it talks about how we're to do battle as well. Above all, take on the shield of faith in which you will be able to quench the fiery darts of the wicked one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. So as a young person, this is how you find success. This is how you find victory. This is how you overcome the evil one. It's certainly by the word of God. It's interesting, uh, George Bernard Shaw says this, youth is the most wonderful thing in this world, and what a pity that it has to be wasted on children. And it's, uh, it's retweeted by Mark Twain. He says, it's a shame that youth is wasted on the young. Because when you finally get old enough that you understand some things and the stupid things you shouldn't do and the smarter things you should have invested your life in, it's too late because your youth is now gone. Uh, it would be good if we learned early. And then you get this vendetta uh, against life that you just say, I'm going to make sure that every young person knows and they never do stupid things like I did. 
Uh, you have to be careful of that too because you can overdo it. So he says in 13c, I write to you little children. Now this is a little different, this little children. I, I write to you little children because you have known the father. Now this is Padion. Padion is actually a young child. It's not an infant it's a young child, somebody who's learning, somebody that still has the curiosity, you know, they haven't been tainted by the world yet, they, they haven't grown up, but they're little children, and I don't know about you, but as soon as they reach, you know, they call it the terrible twos, and then they're, they can get even worse, but people get to the place, children get to the place where they begin to choose, and they kind of flex their autonomous muscles, where they decide they're going to do what they're going to do, they're going to be who they want to be, that is a very dangerous thing because they will just walk away from under your authority, under your gaze, and they'll do crazy things. I, uh, I found a couple of knives out in my yard the other day, and I realized that my grandchildren are taking knives out of the house and doing whatever and leaving them outside. I blame myself. But here's children. Because you have known the Father, I write to you, who are children. So you're not an infant, you're not a, a, a father, and you're not a young person. You're, you're this child. And the responsibility of a child is to learn. That's why we send them to school. That's why we don't let them out of our sight. Some of you put leashes on them, but that's crazy. But so young children are supposed to be watched, and they're supposed to be schooled, and they're supposed to be trained. And uh, with everybody being home, my grandkids are being taught at home. I can tell you I've had to go and show my, my grandkids what an analog clock is and how to tell time. If you've never had to explain it, then you really don't know how to tell time. Because um, I had to analyze the way I look at time all over again. But anyway, in Hebrews chapter 5, verses 12 to 14 says, For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God. And you have come to need milk and not solid food. What he's doing is, is he's saying, you guys are infants. You, you should by now be mature. You should be further along than you are, but you're, you still need milk. You need to be breastfed here because you, you're not understanding basic principles. He says, for everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness. So you see, he's not talking about infant uh, in, in the physical. He's talking about spiritual. And he is a babe. But solid food belongs to those who are of full age, and those that are full grown. And, but solid food belongs to the ones of full age, that is, those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. So you see, maturity isn't something that just happens with time. Uh, if I go back to my neighborhood, I think I can prove that. There are people still living the same exact lives they did when I was a teenager. Uh, you know, they're, they're just wasting their lives. But when you take this and you exercise your senses to discern both good and evil and you are in the midst of being trained, that's when you move from the childhood into young adulthood. It's by taking the information you have, putting it into practice and maturing. So he's talking to them as children. And of course, children, their responsibility is to get bigger and stronger and smarter and to grow out of childhood. Uh, very often we push them further and harder than they need to be. 1 Corinthians 13, 11, uh, Paul saying this at the end of a large dissertation I'd love to get into. But when I was a child, I spoke as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. Now, you may have a few things in your life that you consider childish, that you still haven't given up. Uh, it's a good idea to consider those things, giving them up. You might find yourself free of a lot of foolishness. So childishness is something that we kind of enjoy because we wish we were young, but uh, I'm, I'm glad I'm not as uh, unlearned as I was when I was a child. So he's writing to the little children because they've known the father. And he says, I've written to you fathers. He's saying this again. I'm not, um, I'm not mistaking it, this. He writes it again. I've written you fathers because you have known him who is from the beginning. He's talking about a mature relationship. A mature person is somebody that should give leadership, should give teaching, should give guidance, should give warning, should give um, encouragement. This is what fathers should do. People that are in that older state, and you'll always find somebody who's younger in Christ than you, which means you have a responsibility to take them by the hand. Everyone should have somebody like Paul in their lives where they can look up to and be discipled by them. 
Everyone should have somebody like Timothy in their lives, somebody who's learning, somebody who's up and coming, who doesn't even understand who their gifts are, what their calling is, what it is to have a relationship with God. They don't know these things and so much that you can share with them. And then I believe every man should have someone that's like a Barnabas, somebody that's alongside, somebody that they can have fellowship with where they can sharpen each other. But not two exact people, but two people that are very similar in maturity. Uh, it's, a, it's a wonderful life when you can have all of those. It leaves a hole when you don't have them. So, fathers, because from the beginning you have known him. And that's that word, kenoskis, again. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 7 to 11, it says, But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, this spirit of God that we have inside our bodies, that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. In other words, it's not about the vessel. It's about what the vessel contains. We are hard-pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Always carrying about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body. For we who live are always delivered to death for Jesus' sake that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. That is the statement of a mature father, a mature person that understands, listen, you're going to get knocked down, but you're not going to get knocked out. You're going to be distressed, but you're not going to be perplexed. You're not going to be out of the game. It's something where you're going to have hardship in your life, and you just take it in stride because everything changes. Just like a temptation. You have a temptation in your life. You have a thought. You, You want to go on an impulse. But I've got news for you. It will disappear if you don't feed it. It will go away. Good news. So if I want to eat an entire pizza, it doesn't mean I have to eat an entire pizza. I can. I'll just let you know in case you're wondering. But I won't. I just won't. So here's the deal. A mature person thinks like this, that it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives within me. I don't live for myself. I live for the Lord. That's what a mature person understands and says and demonstrates by every word, by every syllable, by everything they do, everywhere they go. That the dying of the Lord Jesus occurs in me so that he might live in my place. So, another one for you in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 26 to 27. And I, I got it from the Christian Standard Bible because I like the way that it says it. This is another statement that a mature Christian father, somebody who's a leader, would say. So I do not run like one who runs aimlessly. Or I do not box, he means fighting, like one who is beating the air. Instead, I discipline my body and I bring it under strict control so that after preaching to others, I myself will not be disqualified. The statement of a leader like Paul when he says this is, I don't do what I want to do, I do what the Lord would have me do. I don't do everything that I imagine I could do I do those things that are important. I do those things in priority according to God's will. That is a mature statement. That is somebody who is up and coming and becoming a father. And we should all be striving to become spiritually mature to the place where we can say such things with absolute conviction. So I serve the only king who conquered death, hell, and the grave. So as a soldier, we can understand that and follow his lead. And... um, There is nobody who has authority in this life who isn't under authority. Everyone's under authority, certainly God's authority. And 14b, he says, I have written to you, young men, because you are strong, and the word of God abides in you, and you have overcome the wicked one. So reading through this, I guess you get the idea that it's kind of like prose. It's it's a bit like a poem, and he's reoccurring a couple of things. One about young children using a slightly different word, He talks about fathers, and now he's saying, young men, I'm writing to you because you're strong, and the word of God abides in you, and you have overcome the wicked one. So overcoming the wicked one is something he included previously, but what he didn't say is how you overcome the wicked one, and how it is, it's the word of God. And the reason that you're strong is because God's made you strong, and the reason that you live is because the word of God is in you. So he's, he's giving us, I don't know if you remember the legend of King Arthur, if you've ever been... Uh, if you've ever seen the movie or you've ever read the book. But the the thing about King Arthur is he was a child. 
and uh, there was a sword that was put into the stone, and it was said that whoever pulls the sword from the stone, that they would be the next king. So this legend of King Arthur kind of rings in our hearts when, when we think about um, what we do, and I'm completely lost. So while we're getting it back, King Arthur... King Arthur was this guy who had to pull this sword from a stone. Of course, you have all these people lining up to pull this sword from the stone, but they couldn't. And so finally, they, they get this young child who happens by, and he pulls the, stone, pulls the sword from the stone because he's the one who's worthy. He's the one who can do it. So it's a, it's a real interesting thing with him. He says, I, I write to you, young men, because the word of God abides in you. The reason that we can conquer... Uh, the, the demons within and the demons without is because of what God has done. It's about the power that he's given us through the Holy Spirit, but also because the word of God is that which feeds our mind and our hearts. And when that happens, we do and say those things that please God. So, let's see if I can get back. I've written to you young men because you're strong. The legend of King Arthur and how he pulls the sword from the stone. It's because he was the right person to do it. But he was a little child, and he didn't know necessarily what to do with his sword. But those who are strong men, those who are possessing of the word of God, have the ability to control the things that are going on around them as well as what's going on inside them. Where circumstances don't tell you how to behave, what to think, what to say, it's the word of God that guides you as you remember. And so I remember, I have lots of passages memorized because I have lots of flaws. And the more of the word of God I know, the more I'll be able to undo that and take strength and power over those things within myself. It says here in Psalm 119, verses 9 to 11, how can a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed according to your word. With my whole heart I have sought you. Oh, let me not wander from your commandments. Your word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. One of the secrets of somebody that walks and understands what self-control is, understands what it is to be submitted to God and not controlled by situations or even their, their own upbringing, their own background, their own genetics, something that you understand as, as a solid Christian, a mature Christian, is that the word of God is that which you have submitted your life to, and that is the governance of your life. When you commit yourself to know the word of God and, better yet, do the word of God, the blessings of God come along with it. And so that's what we do. And so he says, I'm writing to you, young men, because you are strong and the word of God abides in you, which is the secret. Uh, all of Psalm 119 talks about the word of God. Revelation 12, 11, it's talking about those in the end times who begin sharing about Jesus, even though persecution is heightened, it's the great tribulation, and people are being killed for their testimony. It says here that they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives to the death. In other words, they didn't think that they should turn their back, be like Judas, and say, ah, you know, I, I don't know Jesus, or uh, turn their back on him, even unto death. And so there will be martyrs in the end times, but it says that they will overcome by the blood of the lamb, which is the sacrifice that Jesus has made to forgive us of our sins and to make us not slaves to them. And number two, the word of their testimony. Your testimony is about what God has done in you and for you and to you. That's your testimony. So the testimony is really about Jesus Christ. It's not about me or anybody else. It's about what he's done. So he says, I write to you strong, you young men, because you're strong and because the word of God abides in you. Really a huge secret to living a victorious Christian life. So a couple of things that I walk away with and I'll share with you. As a child of God, we are free from our sins and we're encouraged to remember the joy of his presence. When I read a passage like this, it says, my little children. He's speaking to me. I'm still a child of God. I'm still a little boy in a lot of ways, but I'm also still young in Christ in a lot of ways. So I accept that from him, and I need to be like a little child, cry out to him when I have trouble, when I'm suffering, or when I'm questioning, or when I'm uh, 
uh, finding it confusing, I need to cry out to God like a little child would. So I will do that, but I'll also cry out because I enjoy spending time with him. Uh, very difficult time. If you just try to kill time and wait for this to all be over, you're going to find out that you wasted a lot of time. Or you could put it to use and spend time with the Lord and get excited in his presence. And, I, and I hopefully we have a little more time to do that. And then as little children, we are, we are encouraged to progressive obedience and not stagnate in our spiritual growth. So as a little child, as Jesus calls me a little child, I have a long way to go. I have a long uh, track of, of things that I have yet to learn and I, I haven't reached it yet. But I accept that too, that I, I'm like a young child who still needs to be taught, needs to be educated. I need to read the word and I'm still dependent. So I will do that and I'll accept that. And as a father, we are instructed to mature intimacy, to be an example of him so that others may know him like we do. So as a father, if you have any spiritual maturity whatsoever, God asks you to get closer with him, to get tighter with him so that all of what you do and say will be examples of who he is so that people might come to know him even as you do. And hopefully we're examples of that in everything that we do. And as youth, we are to use our strength to be disciplined fighters for the kingdom and not waste away in the world, but be filled with his word. So as those who God says, you are young, and if, if you're still alive, you're still young. You still have some ability. You have some influence. You have some wisdom. You have something to impart to someone else. If that's the case for you, then accept it as a father, that you are to be leading and guiding and pointing people to him. As you get to know him better, you get to reveal him better to the people that are around you. And so that's what I want to strive to do as a child, uh, as a little child, as a child that's dependent, as a strong man, uh, as a, a, a young man, but also as someone who has some maturity and some track record with the Lord. So hopefully that encourages you and it kind of sums up everything that I've been able to get out of it as I've been reading. So... Next week, we're going to turn to verses 15 to 17, which says this. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. For the world is passing away, and the lust of it, but he who does the will of God abides forever. So we'll look at that next week. I trust that the Lord is blessing you guys and strengthening you. And I want you to remember this about the word of God, that all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. May God bless you in the hearing of his word. Amen.